Thank you, Michael. Um, March 2022, uh, it's amazing how much has gone on since we first started qualifying and, and moving through each window. We were able to see the team gain um, valuable experience throughout each window and we're prepared. As we enter this final window, we know there's gonna be challenges um, involved. We know there's gonna be ups, we know there's gonna be downs, but we're in good position right now and our goal is to finish it off and qualify for the World Cup by the end of these three games. So, um, you know, we, tough opening game in, in Mexico City, then we come home to a great crowd in Orlando, then we're back on the road in San Jose. And, um, you know, we expect all 27 players to play some type of role, and we're really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, we'll begin with questions and start with Brian Strauss from Sports Illustrated. Thanks, Michael. Um, I, I know you may have addressed this on Sports Center, but if you could provide an update on, on what you know about Serginio, that would be great. Um, and, and then the, the other question I had was, obviously rotation is always a topic of, of conversation. And I was curious uh, in your experience uh, uh, playing at Azteca and, and, and sort of keeping track of guys' fitness, is it possible to go 60 to 90 minutes at Azteca uh, and then play again uh, three days later? Do you, do you, or, or do you imagine sort of using two completely different platoons of players? Thanks. No, it's, it's certainly possible. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't rule out a, a player being able to play 90 minutes at Azteca and, and 90 minutes in, in Orlando and 90 minutes again in, in San Jose. When you look at some of our players, the rhythm that they're playing is basically, you know, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, um, through most of the year. So some of our players, not all of them, but some of them are prepared and some of them are, will be able to play three 90 minute games. And it's just identifying who. And then, um, and then rotating other ones out that, that aren't able to play that amount. Regarding Serginho, you know, it's, it's not great news, um, the initial diagnosis. It, it seems to be um, a hamstring injury, but we're going to get the final details tomorrow. Um, but, you know, we may need to replace them. And, and we, you know, we've already identified candidates to replace them, and we're already, um, you know, prepared to speak to him first thing tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next will be Doug McIntyre from Fox. Thank you, Michael. Hey, Greg, thanks for doing this. Um, curious how much you think you can use Gio Reyna in these games. He's obviously not started a game uh, or, or gone 90 minutes for Dortmund in, in five or so months. Um, and second question on John Brooks, you know, what went into that decision to, you know, call in two center backs that um, that have no World Cup qualifying experience over a guy that uh, you know is playing week in and week out in one of the top leagues in the world. Thank you. Yeah. So regarding John Brooks, you know, I had a good conversation with him and explained to him that this is our, our thinking for the window. Um, this is what we chose to do in this window. It doesn't determine his future with the national team, and I think that's a very important distinction. You know, like all these guys who who weren't included in the initial roster, it doesn't mean that they, they don't have a role to play in the future. So we, we did what we thought was best for this window and the way we want to play. And, you know, sometimes we leave players out. Sometimes we bring them in based on our opponents and based on what we're trying to do in this window. So that's John. Um, regarding Gio, I had a, a good call with Dortmund today, with the coach of Dortmund, and, you know, planning out his usage and planning out how much we think we can use him. The important thing is, you know, Gio – returning to the club. The important thing is us qualifying for the World Cup, first of all, but secondly, is Gio returning healthy to his club. And we're mindful of his load. We're mindful of the work that he's done in the last um, couple of weeks, and we're going to adjust accordingly. Thank you. Yep. Next will be Ron Blum from the Associated Press. Hey, Greg. What is the current condition with uh, Zach's uh, back and uh, shoulder? Obviously, he dressed the other day. Is he 100%? Is he still working his way back? And also with Matt and the foot, there have been some scuttlebutt that he may have had frostbite in addition from the Minnesota game. Is there anything to that? Um, so I'll take Matt first. Um, you know, his, his injury has nothing to do with frostbite, the reason why he's not playing. Um, 
you know, if you guys have been following their preseason and following their games, you know, you'll know exactly when it happened. Um, it was a play in, in one of the games. So it's unfortunate, you know, and, and hopefully he's going to be back soon. But, you know, we're going to miss him this window. Regarding Zach, he's in full training. Um, you know, speaking to the Manchester City staff, they're confident um, enough to put him on the bench and, and he would have to play if, if there's an injury. And there's potential that he plays this weekend. So he's been training really well. Um, we've been getting that feedback, and he's he's ready to go. Thank you. Thanks. Next will be Paul Tenorio from the Athletic. Michael, Greg, I wanted to loop back um, again to kind of the the rotation idea. I know a lot of players are playing, you know, every three days, but there is a bit of a difference in going to the Azteca and playing at altitude, and then going and playing three days later. How, how do you plan on just kind of monitoring? how players are recovering or thinking about kind of the, the extra bit that goes into to playing against a, a rival like Mexico. And then I wonder um, in replacing Weston, um, how do you see those, those three options and um, do you, are those options at that position to replace him? And is Gio Reyna in consideration playing centrally uh, when he does come in versus, versus just on the wing? I know he's listed as a winger. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't rule out Gio being able to play there. The pro the issue is just his rhythm, um, his fitness, and um, and you know his game time in his last five months, right? So, you know, if, eventually I think it's a position he can play, and we'll have to see if it if it happens in this window. You know, regarding M Mexico City, um, you know, I think the important thing is first to look at the starting point of um, of where these guys are coming from. So if a guy is fully fit and playing every week and has 90 minutes after under his belt for you know con considerable amount of weeks, he'll be fine. He'll be they'll be fatigued a little bit at altitude, but they'll be they'll be able to get through it. Um, you know, I've had personal experience there. Um, you know, getting feedback from other countries that have played there already, getting feedback from the MLS teams that have played there already. You know, it's something you can get through, and um, so. Our, our job is to put, you know, 11 players on the field that can win the game. And, and that's what we're here for. You know, we're here to win soccer games and, and we're going to put guys on the field against Mexico, against Panama and against Costa Rica that we feel can win the game. Next will be Stephen Goff from the Washington Post. Hey, Greg, thanks a lot. Um, two questions for you. One, um, maybe backing down Paul's question about Mexico City. Um, what you know, what special uh, preparations do you make when you play at, at altitude? If you could share maybe a little bit of, of how you do that. And uh, second question, given his playing time and his form, would you say Ethan Horvath maybe has, has inched into that, that uh, number one spot? Thanks. He's definitely in contention. There's no question about it. He's performed um, excellent lately, and it's going to be uh, uh, up to the last minute decision. You know, we're going to have to assess both of them when they come into camp. Um, you know, Zach's back. He's healthy. He's traditionally, you know, the, the number one goalkeeper or, um, you know, in contention to be number one. So, you know, it's uh, we'll, we'll view them when they come into camp. I mean, regarding, again, Mexico City, it's you know, there's there's little things you can do, but unless you're there at altitude, um, you know, it's hard to make a, a huge dent in it. But we, we've been checking the players' blood and making sure they have, you know, the, the necessary things to compete at that altitude. We'll go to Jeff Carlisle from ESPN FC. Thanks, Michael. Hey, Greg. Um, you know, in terms of replacing Weston, um, you know, is it, safe to say that Kellen and, and Luca are, are the, the two prime candidates to replace him. And how does that change, you know, given the opponent? And then in terms of a Serginho possible replacement, might you err on the side of getting someone a little bit more familiar playing left back? Because it, it seems outwardly that Anthony is kind of the only guy who lately has spent a lot of time there. Yeah, we, we will do that. If he can't go, that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll bring in someone that can play left back. Um, it's a good shout, Jeff. Uh, we had Serginio originally as cover at left back, but obviously with that, with that gone, um, you know, we can be potentially exposed. We also see Kellen Acosta potentially being able to play left back, but with him having minutes in midfield, you know, it may not be ideal. So we'd probably do something like that. Um, regarding Weston, you know, you, you don't replace him. 
that's the thing, you know, it's, you know, he's been so important to this group that it's not, you know, we're not going to plug a guy in and get a like for like, but that's okay. You know, we've won games before without him um, and we'll do it again. Uh, some of the guys that come to mind, Kellen's an obvious candidate that comes to mind. We have um, Luca De La Torre that, that can play their position. We have, um, we have Brendan Aronson that can play there, Gio Reyna that can play there, um, Roll Dan and one other player, and Eunice obviously who's, who can line up there. So we have, you know, we'll have enough bodies um, to, to get someone on the field that we feel can perform the role adequately. Okay, thanks. Next will be Grant Wall. Hey, Greg, good to see you. Hey, Grant. Um, what went into the decisions to bring back Jordan Peefock and not bring back Josh Sargent this time? Just goals. It was, an, you know, it's the, the type of form that Jordan's in, the type of game we see happening, um, you know, in specifically in Orlando, we think we're going to need a box presence. We think we're going to need someone there that can finish off crosses. And, and he's been doing great. He's been doing a really good job, very physical presence in, um, in, in Switzerland, scoring a ton of goals. You know, with Josh, it's a, it's a real tricky one, man. And I, I wish you guys could help me out on this one. You know, he's playing right wing for his team, um, not getting a ton of chances, not active uh, offensively that much, but he works his ass off and, and he's an ultimate team player. So that it's, it's a tough decision. You know, for us, it's almost like trying to project his performance if he played striker for us. You know, Josh is a guy that I, I think is going to, going to break through and going to be a, um, you know, a national team number nine in the future. And we just have to be patient and wait. Thanks, Grant. Next will be Ivis Galarsep. Greg, you mentioned goals. Um, Ricardo Pepe's in here. It's been five months since he scored a goal. Obviously, everyone expected him to be part of this group, but how kind of concerned are you about where he is? in terms of confidence and in terms of his just kind of adjustment period in Germany. And then the follow up on, on, on John Brooks, you, you said the last couple of windows that, you know, for this window, not this window, then the next window, not this window. There's five center backs in this camp. There's two others who are injured and Chris Richards and Mark McKenzie, that's seven center backs. So as it stands right now, you could, someone could argue he's eighth on your depth chart. It, it, do you understand why maybe it's kind of looking like maybe we'll never see him again at center back um, for you? Is that an unfair assessment or what do you think about that idea that, Maybe we've seen the last of him with the U.S. national team. Yeah, I think that's unfair. And the reason why is, you know, I've talked to him. So, you know, the when you look at these windows, and I, I hate to get detailed about this, um, you know, regarding an individual player, but when you look at the window in, in October, um, you know, he had an injury. November, um, you know, we weren't happy with his form. Um, in November and January, we weren't happy with his club form. Now he's back playing, and, and now it becomes about what our game plan is for this window. And, and there's some details in his game that I talked to him that we need to improve to fit into our game up. And we don't have time on Tuesday to, to improve these things. The game's on Thursday. You know, the game's on Sunday. There's not a runway here. So I think when this whole thing settles down, and hopefully we're in the World Cup and we have the June window, the September window. I think there'll be another opportunity for him where we can really start addressing where we think his deficiencies are um, to be the starting center back in our pool. But like a lot of players, you know, there's, you know, we're not, or like all players, we're never going to rule a guy out. That's not how we work. Uh, if I may, on this topic, point out something from your colleagues, if you could Look at the tweet from Derek Ray. He does have a quote from John Brooks uh, that I think you'd be able to use. Uh, next, we will go to Sebastian Salazar from ESPN. Uh, hey, Greg, guys. Thanks for the time. Just on the uh, rotations, I wonder if that kind of goes out the window, given the fact that if you take care of business in those first two games, the third game kind of doesn't matter. So does it change your approach at all with what we've seen in the past? windows with three games which is a, a significant rotation in that second game yeah I think that I think that's a decent point you know I mean the, the one thing for sure that we know is Costa Rica has to win their games right so they're going to be playing their best possible lineup in all three games so if, if it comes down to it 
um, you know, they're going to have a group that that has played two games as well. So, I mean, for us, it's it, it's not trying to get cute. It's trying to put teams on the field in each game that we think can win the game. We know we're going to, you know, the, I think the beauty of this thing is we have five subs and we're in Mexico City. We're going to use all five subs. We may use some earlier. We may be more purposeful with how we use these substitutes, but there's going to be five subs in that game. And then it's about, you know, how do we, how are we planning for the next game um, as well? But, you know, I think that's a valid point. We'll have to see as, as we go. Next would be Paul Kennedy from Soccer America. Thank you, Michael. And thanks, Greg. Um, three players who have not played that much recently in Europe are uh, Tyler Adams, Tim Weah, and uh, Ricardo Pepe, who uh, I think Ivis just mentioned. Can you assess their situation and their ability to uh, um, play a lot of time in these three qualifiers, given the fact that they haven't um, played few 90s in the last month? Who was the, th who was the second one that you said? Tim Weah. Timmy, Pepe, and who was the other one? Tyler. Tyler, yeah, 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 yep, Tyler, got it. Um, yeah, so I'll start with Pepe, and I was sorry for not answering your question. That totally, it wasn't intentional. I, I, I gave you an extended version of the John Brooks, so I, I mistakenly didn't answer that one. R R R am I concerned about Ricardo Pepe? Absolutely, no question about it. Um, you know, we want him scoring goals. We want all our strikers scoring goals. And you could make the case that, it, you know, why isn't Josh, in, you know, included in the roster if, if he's not scoring and Pepe's not scoring. But, you know, one thing with Ricardo is, you know, getting back to the basics with him. He's a goal scorer. That comes naturally to him. And that's something we need him to refocus on, clear his mind, focus on doing the small things, getting in good positions, because if he gets in good positions, we're comfortable he's going to score. You know, he's asked to play so slightly different um, for Augsburg when he's on the field. They're creating chances by him running behind the back line, not so much from service. And, you know, we hopefully will get some more service into the penalty box and, and that will help him out a little bit when he plays. So it is a concern of mine, but I've spoken to him at length and, and he's ready to go for this window. Timmy's been getting a little bit more game time lately, but certainly not the 90 minutes that we expect out of him. And that is a little bit of a concern. We're going to have to use him. Um, in spots in this window. It, I don't think it's realistic to think that Timmy can play three 90 minute games, but he's, re he's certainly going to be valuable for us in this window. And then regarding Tyler, you know, with, with some guys, it comes down to mind over matter. And, and, and Tyler, you know, that's got to be the case for him. He's an important part of his team. Um, we need to have him on the field. And even though he hasn't been getting game time, he's been training, he's fit and he's ready to go. Thanks. Yep. Next will be Sam Stasco from The Athletic. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Greg. Hope you're doing well. Um, there was a lot of talk ahead of last camp and during last camp about Christian and his form and his role with Chelsea and his role with you guys. Um, he didn't answer a lot of those questions on the field, maybe, until the last game when he brought him off the bench against Honduras. Um, but he seems to be answering them pretty resoundingly uh, with, with Chelsea here over the last few weeks. Um, how, I guess, have you seen his... Uh, form, his mental state um, since the last camp, um, and, and what what do you expect from him here going forward, particularly with his ability to seemingly really step up in the biggest games for club and country? Yeah, you know, um, it's been a pleasure to watch, and, and, you know, I say this all the time, you know, when I was asked about him last one, I said, it's, you know, it's a roller coaster, especially when you're at a club like Chelsea, when you're at these massive clubs, it's very, very difficult. And all they ask him to do is just to keep fighting, keep working and, and wait for his opportunity. And he's done that and he's, and he's taken advantage of it. You know, he's be, become again, an important part of their team. He's shown that he can step up and, and score goals and make assists. And, you know, he's got a great knack for arriving in the penalty box and, and he's got a finishing touch to him. You know, he's very good when he's in front of goal. So for us, you know, we expect very similar things. Like, you know, it's, he doesn't, again, he, he needs to keep arriving in the box because we know when he gets in good position, he scores and just continue to focus on the basics. And, and he'll be, you know, he'll be the leader that we expect him to be. Next will be Charles Bone from MLSsoccer.com. 
Hi, Greg. Thanks for chatting today. Uh, Two-parter from me. Uh, you maybe you gave a hint uh, with uh, with the the Pepe uh, words or a few moments ago, but do you have a set starter at the number nine spot at this time? Um, and two is why do you think Costa Rica has been such a nightmare trip for this program over the decades, and how might that history influence your approach? Um. So regarding the starter, you know, we're, we'll see when we get in training. You know, we have some ideas, but, you know, I wouldn't infer from what I said that Pepe is going to be the starter necessarily. Um, we got to see him when he comes in camp. Right? Um, you know, although we have limited time, we'll, we'll have to assess these guys. Um, and regarding Costa Rica, you know, it's it, you would think that when they move to the national stadium that it would be um, it would be easier to get results and it hasn't turned out like that you know I remember playing in Saprissa and that was one that was the most volatile place in CONCACAF at the time and it was just an absolute cauldron and by the way they also had a really good generation of players that they were that have just been coming through and so you know give them a ton of credit for getting back into this right before last window people were writing them off and now they're right in the thick of it and it's going to be a difficult game for us but Again, as I mentioned in the opening, is that you know these are types of challenges that that we need to embrace and that we need to hit head on because they're difficult games and and we're looking forward to them. We'll go to Jonathan Tanawal from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Greg, for the time. Um, where do you see Gianluca Busio fitting in, and is he a candidate for any of Weston McKenney's minutes given his sort of two-way ability? Yeah, I think he is. I think he's, you know, that was a player that I forgot to mention. I apologize for that. You know, Gianluca has been adapting and doing a great job of, of getting on the field in Italy, um, highly competitive league, and he keeps finding his way on the field. He's playing different positions. Sometimes he's attacking, sometimes he's defensive. But we see him, um, you know, as cover in two positions, attacking mid and center mid, just as we see James Sands as, as cover in, in center mid and center back. So we think we have some versatility in, in the 27 players that we bought in. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to getting back in touch with these guys and seeing them on the field. Next would be Ryan Talmich from Goal.com. Hey, Greg, just looking at Brendan Aronson, like he's a guy that every time he comes back to camp, it seems like he's taken a different step forward. And you just look at the things he's been doing over the last few months with Salzburg and, and going toe to toe with Bayern Munich and playing well in the Champions League and kind of taking that leap into a different type of player. What are the things you've seen from him in the last few months and since last camp? And, and what are the things you're expecting to kind of see from him going forward? No, he's been he's been doing great. He's been taking the steps. You'd like to see that the development path just keep going like that. And that's what he's been doing, really improving his game. Um, I, I still want to see him finishing attacks off more, especially if he's playing the winger position for us. I think that's not, that's an, um, an area of emphasis, but he's fantastic at pressing, um, great work rate, gives the team energy, and he's going to be important in this, in, this, um, in this window as well. Next will be Andrew Jones. Hey, Greg, hope that you're having a good Thursday. And if you filled out a bracket or any brackets that they're not you know, broken um, right now in terms of college basketball, um, you have Eric Palmer Brown on this roster as he's had a great last few weeks for Twa, really playing the best soccer um, of his career. Uh, what for you have you seen from EPB that has had him risen up now to getting this call up um, in this important period? Like most of you guys, I have North Carolina winning it all. Uh, I'm sure you have the same thing. And they, they started the tournament um, with a resounding, really good. resounding win over Marquette. Go Heels. Um, you know, he's an example of a guy that we just kept watching him and, and seeing the improvement every single week and seeing the tenacity and how he defends his ability to deal with, with pace, deal with runners behind the back line, his um, – his ability to carry the ball forward, to build, to make passes and build up. So he's been doing a great job. I mean, League One in France is a difficult league for center defenders. When you look at a lot of, of top center defenders, they've come from League One. And, you know, he's doing a great job lately. And we're really excited to get him back into camp and work with him. 
Thanks, Andrew. We've got two more questions and we'll start with Claudio Villalobos. Uh, thank you, Michael. Greg, um, how, how much different has the preparation for these games has become um, because of the fact that um, all the teams in contention have something to, to fight for, uh, except for uh, perhaps Panama playing Honduras, everybody else has something to say in the, in, on the rest of the games. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a little bit of the difference between this window and last window is that, you know, teams are, are now officially eliminated and some teams aren't. You know, what I would say is nothing's changed. We've been preparing hard for every window. We prepared hard for this window. And each and every window brings its own challenges and each and every window is difficult. You know, it's, you know, whatever we're predicting is going to happen in this window, throw it, throw it out because something else will happen. Trust me, that, that's how this whole thing has been going. And um, it's exciting. And for us, it's only about staying in the moment, not getting ahead of ourselves and focusing on each training session and each game as they come. And if we do that, we'll be, we'll be successful. Our last question comes from Pilar Perez from ESPN. Hi, thank you, Michael. Hi, Greg. Uh, about what happened in Mexico in terms of the violence between fans, what security guarantees did the Mexican Federation give you? And if there is any concern between you, the players, or anyone else? You know, I haven't been part of meetings, but we've been ensured that it's going to be a safe environment in Azteca. And I think that the Mexican Federation was just as appalled as what happened as the rest of the world. And they don't condone condone that type of behavior at all, and it and it, it hasn't happened with the when, when the next Mexican, Mexican national team is playing. So you know I'm sure there's going to be added security, and um, you know I'm sure it's going to be in safe environment for both Mexican fans and U.S. fans. And you know it, that type of thing has no place in in the game. As competitive as the game is, you know it, it has that type of violence has no place. <laughs> 